Go ahead and encourage you to take a copy of the Bible and open with me to the book of Philippians as we continue through our series through Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 2 is where we will be today. Philippians chapter 2. Um, of course, if you grew up like me watching Sesame Street, there was a bit or a jingle that they used to do. One of the things that Sesame Street tried to do was, again, to teach kids different things. And one of the things that they would do is they would try to teach you how to notice differences among people or differences among objects. And they had this bit and they had a little jingle. One of these things is not like the others, okay? Um, and so there would usually be three things. It might be three people or it might be three shoes or it might be three of something else, two would be similar, and the third one would be different. Again, teaching kids how to identify things that are different from them or different from others. Well, one of the things that we know and understand as Christians, as followers of Christ, is that we are to be different. There's something that should stand out about us to the rest of the world. But how is it that we stand out? Because there's nothing that happens to us when we come to Christ, when we are converted, that automatically identifies us to the rest of the world as a follower of Christ. We don't all of a sudden get a birthmark on our forehead or something when we come to Christ that lets everybody know, hey, this person is a Christian. So what is it? There must be something else that marks us or shows to the world this person is a follower of Christ. And there are a lot of different ways, a lot of different things that cause us and should cause us to stand out. And there are a few of those that Paul discusses today in our passage. So if you've got your place in Philippians 2, I invite you to stand with me as we read our passage today, beginning in chapter, or I'm sorry, in verse 12. So Philippians 2, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a wicked, or excuse me, of a crooked and twisted generation." among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's pray together. Father, this morning we thank you for the gift of Jesus and we thank you, Father, that we are saved through him. We thank you for the gift of your word and we ask this morning that you would teach us as we study it together this morning. We pray, Father, that we would see how this points us toward the gospel, how it points us, Lord, to new life in you and, Father, into a life of growth and sanctification. And God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So our main idea of the sermon this morning is that disciples of Christ are enabled by the power of God to be a witness in a dark world. Disciples of Christ are enabled by the power of God to be a witness in a dark world. And so there's three things about disciples I think we see in this text that show us how we're different and how we are to be a light in a world that is crooked and twisted. The first thing that we see or the first characteristic of disciples we see is that disciples obey God. Disciples of Christ obey God. Look with me again at verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. So like we've seen a couple, like we saw a couple weeks ago, and like we see in Paul's letters, he begins this section with the word therefore. And so we know that that clues us in, that, that what he's about to tell us, we need to understand in light of what he just told us before. We saw this in chapter 2, verse 1. So it needs to be understood in light of the teaching he just gave us. So over the last two weeks, God has explained to us and taught us Paul's teaching on the humiliation and the exaltation of Jesus. So what Paul is about to say, we need to understand in light of Christ's humiliation and in light of Christ's exaltation. Paul has given us the example of Christ, which is the key to single-mindedness and a life worthy of the gospel, which he talked about uh, earlier in chapter 2. 
a life worthy of the change that God has brought within us. So now he's saying, in light of Christ's example of humility, obey God. Be obedient to God. That's what he means when he says, therefore, my beloved, as you, as, as you have always obeyed, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, obey God. And he says to them, he's, he's not saying they've all of a sudden stopped being obedient. He's actually commended them here, saying, you've been obedient. He's saying, you've always obeyed. So what's changed? What is it that Paul's having to get at that he has to remind them to obey? Well, what's changed is that now Paul's not there to supervise them. Because what's he saying? He said, you obeyed while I was there. You obeyed while you were in my presence. But now I'm telling you, now that I am absent, I'm asking you, I'm telling you, I'm commanding you actually, to even though I'm not there, obey God. Don't stop being obedient just because I'm not there to look over your shoulder. And we know that's hard as people, right? One of the worst things that can happen in an elementary classroom is that moment when the teacher stands out or steps out and they, you know, they, they have the, the, the monitor there who's supposed to watch things because they know at that point, hey, nobody's here. It becomes Lord of the Flies all of a sudden. Or over the last couple of years, as many of us have begun to work from home, some of us have probably found it difficult during COVID to work from home because the immediate accountability was not there as it would be while you're in your office. And so real quickly, as a moment of application, we need to ask ourselves, are we being obedient or holy for uh, other people because we want to look holy? Or are we being obedient because it's something that God has commanded us to do? And just a quick word to students and young people. Some of you are gaining freedom as you're getting older and as you, others as you are going to get older and you're able to drive and go places where you'll be away from your parents they're not going to always be there to watch over you and to be obedient or to make sure you're, that you are doing what you ought to do, especially when you leave home and you go to college. So I'm not trying to shame you or wag my finger at you. God is not like Santa Claus, wanting to watch whether we're naughty or nice. But our prayer and our hope is that you are converted and that God cultivates within you a heart for obedience. And a desire to obey comes out of genuine reverence and love for God so that your desire becomes to obey God more than it is even to please your parents. And so God is the one we are accountable to for our obedience. And then Paul gives us kind of a curious phrase here in verse 12. Let's look at that together. He says, work out your, or at the end, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, some of us hear that. And it causes us some confusion because it might sound like Paul's con contradicting himself here and what he's taught in other places. And even what else he's going to teach later on as we get into chapter 3 in Philippians. So is Paul contradicting himself? Is Paul teaching us that we must obey God and work for our salvation? Is he contradicting what he's taught us in other places about God's grace and how we are saved through faith? Well, the quick answer is no, he's not. So let's understand why. Notice what he says when he says, work out your salvation. He says, work out your salvation. He doesn't say, work for your salvation. That is a subtle, slight difference, but it's important. Christian theology connects our obedience to God with an inward change that happens to us in the gospel. Our obedience is an overflow of an inward change that takes place within us when we are converted. In other words, when we grew up, many of you grew up calling it when you are saved. But when we hear salvation, when we hear that word salvation and we hear about God's plan for salvation, we often just think about one part of our salvation, and that is our conversion. Okay, usually we think about that when we think of the word salvation, we think of our conversion. When we go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, when God's, God applies to us salvation, when we are justified, when we are adopted, all of that taking place, when we come to God in faith through Christ. But that is only one part of salvation. Our conversion is just one part of God's work of salvation in us. 
Salvation also includes our spiritual growth. It also includes what we call sanctification, where we become more mature Christians, where we grow in our faith and we become more like Jesus. And part of that process is our obedience to God. So when Paul says, work out salvation, he's not commanding them to earn their salvation. He's saying, put your salvation to work. Work to show your salvation in obedience to God, to show your salvation, not earn your salvation. Our obedience to God is the work of our salvation. Now, what are we to make of, God's, of Paul's command to do so with fear and trembling? or fear and reverence, as some of your other translations might say. It means that we view God correctly as we obey him. To see God as greater, to see him as more powerful, to see him as majestic. That's what it means to obey God or to see him correctly. And when we see God as in, and understand his majesty in the limited way that we do, and we see him as more powerful than us, when we see all of that, then we want to obey him and to be holy before him. And to do so with fear and trembling is to approach God in humility, rightly viewing ourselves the way Paul described earlier in Philippians 2. Now here's where we need to be careful and how we need to remember we look at this full explanation of what Paul has given us. We could read this and conclude that our obedience and our spiritual growth is a result of our grit and determination. That we just kind of white knuckled, grab onto something and let it pull us along. Or, we, or rather we push ourselves and pull ourselves along. Now that is partly correct because we just saw our growth does depend on obedience and it does require our effort, but the power and the means are not our own. Look with me at verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So here's what we need to understand about God. Anything that God calls us to do Anything that God commands us to do, he gives us the means and the ability to do it. He gives us, through his grace, the power to obey him and the ability to obey him. If God calls us to be obedient to him, then he will give us the power and ability which he has done in the gospel. So our effort in being obedient is a result of the work of God's grace. That's what he says right here. For it is God who works in you. Paul explained to the Corinthians about how God's grace, which we receive, and God's power work together. Listen as I read 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me, or that is with me. So when Paul says, yes, I'm working both for your growth and mine, but it is not my power in me that's causing, it to, to, or causing this to happen. It is the power of God within me. And look what it is that God does to cause us to be obedient. He works in us both to will, which means to want to, or to have the desire to obey, and to work, effort, and obedience. So our minds are renewed when we are converted. Our minds are transformed. Our desires are changed to become God's desires. And his power within us enables us to be obedient, obedient working out our salvation. So before we can work in obedience, before we can work out our salvation by being obedient, God has to change our will to match his will, to want the things that God wants. And that's what Paul is saying happens right here. So why does God have to do that? It's because even after we are saved, even after we are converted, there is this remnant of a sin nature that is within us. And if we naturally wanted to obey, Paul wouldn't have to give the command to obey. And as we grow and as our sanctification increases, our battles with our sin nature will become more victorious. 
They will never fully go away this side of heaven. But they may, and they may not become easier, but as our growth results, it, as our growth, as our growth increases, it results in more victories and greater obedience. And some of us today, maybe you've grown discouraged in your growth. You go, man, I haven't grown in the Lord as much as I should have by now. I've been a believer for however many years or however many months, and I thought this would get better. And maybe it's just taking a while. And friend, if that's you, then I would encourage you to remember that sanctification and Christian growth and discipleship is a long walk. Eugene Peterson had a title of a book that says it's a long walk in the slow to, in the same direction. And sometimes we will grow very quickly and rapidly. Other times it's just step by step. So in the moments of temptation, pray that God would give you the strength and the grace to withstand those temptations and be able to look back and say, all right, are there moments are, or see if you can identify, here's where I have grown in this area over the last several months, in the last several years. Even if it's just small increments, look at those evidences of God's grace in your life and give him glory for that. And parents, we need to also remember how slow sanctification can be as times when we transition into different seasons with our children. When our children make mistakes, and even when they seem wayward and seem to reject God, pray for God to work and to bring them to repentance, which he will if they are his. And that is why it's important for us as parents to pray for our kids to be converted, not just compliant. Don't give up praying for them, shepherding them as we have opportunity. And others of us who are older, maybe, maybe those of us who are older, we kind of developed these habits and patterns. We begin to say, you know what? At this point in my life, this is just who I am. You can insert whatever habit, whatever phrase, whatever we might put in there. But friends, Christian growth does not stop while we are here on earth. And if there is an area where you can, where you can grow, where you can become more godly, then we need to pray for God to grow us in that area and to change our heart to desire to be obedient. Asking God to reveal our blind spots, whether you are 25, 50, or 100, there is no statute of limitations on obedience to God. So yes, disciples of Christ obey God. And as God commands our obedience, we see that there's also an earthly purpose for our obedience, which is what we see next. So not only do disciples obey God, disciples shine. Disciples shine. Verse 14, look with me there. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So he's telling them to the Philippians to be obedient, and one of the ways that they will be obedient is by doing all things without grumbling or disputing. All things. All things without grumbling, without complaining. Now, there were plenty of things that the Philippians could have grumbled and complained about. We know from the rest of the letter that there's conflict going on in the church. We know that they were also under a civil authority which was hostile to their faith. There could have been plenty of reasons for them to grumble. And this is not just a Philippian ancient problem. This is a problem that we have as well. We're really good at grumbling, aren't we? We complain about our bosses. We complain about our assignments. You might even complain about things here at church. When we want something we don't have, when something, someone isn't acting the way we think they ought to act, when something isn't going our way, often that's our natural bent is to complain, to grumble. And as I said, that can break into conflict or disputing here, as he says. Sometimes we might whisper it to someone. Or other times now, we just blast it on social media. We've kind of lost any kind of bridle when it comes to that. I think it'd be an interesting exercise if you counted this week the number of times you complain about something, whether it's online or in your conversations with others. Just kind of take stock of that. Now, there are times where issues need to be addressed and those things need to be brought to people's attention and that needs to be done in a way that honors them and honors God. That's not what, we're, not what Paul's talking about here. It's not what I'm talking about. Done out of love, not out of spite and anger. But Paul commands them to do all things without grumbling. Why does he say that? What's the purpose in doing all things without grumbling and without complaining? It's because he says, when you do things without grumbling and complaining, what does he say? You will be blameless. 
No one can cast blame on us because it would reveal or cause the Philippians to reveal to a crooked and twisted world the glory of God. Now, Paul has a very interesting way of explaining this here. What he's actually doing is he's making an allusion to the Old Testament. If you remember from your literature classes in English, uh, growing up uh, in school, when someone makes an allusion, that means that we're referring to something in the past. And that's what he's doing here. There are several places in the Old Testament where Israel said that they, it said that they grumbled and complained against God and disputed with God. And when they did so, it kept them from fulfilling their purpose of showing the world God's glory, of showing them what it would look like for them to follow God. And Paul warned the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10. He told them, do not be like the children of Israel. He said, be the opposite of them. And in Deuteronomy 32, God called Israel the crooked and wicked generation. Because of their complaining, because of their disputing with God, because of their unfaithfulness, he said Israel had been the quick, crooked, and twisted generation. But here, Paul has flipped it. The Philippians, who have been changed by grace, if they would cease their bickering, if they would cease their grumbling and their complaining, then they would then be a light to the crooked and twisted generation. Now, Paul's not saying it's just Philippi in which they live is twisted and wicked. Yes, although they certainly did. Someone who is twisted and wicked is anyone who is still in their sin, who rejects the truth of the Bible. And if they cease to dispute and complain, they will show to all of these people who reject God's word, his glory, and fulfill the purpose that Israel was meant to. So the God-powered, grace-filled obedience, which Paul spoke of in verses 12 and 13, is demonstrated by a lack of complaining and disputing. And Paul explains how this worked in Romans 1.5. He said, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations. So their obedience was meant to show how glorious God is, and one of the ways they demonstrate it is through their lack of complaining, not by grumbling or by not grumbling or fighting. Now, the word, ES, the, the word there that the ESV translates as lights, some of your translations may actually say stars. So he's telling them to shine like stars. If you cease to grumble and you grow in your obedience, you will shine like stars to this crooked and twisted generation. So picture with me a moment, a star. Now, it doesn't look like the five-pointed star we're used to seeing. If we study uh, in astronomy what a star is, we learn that a star is a ball of hydrogen and helium gas. And within these, within these balls of gas, these atoms begin to collide. And as they collide, it creates a nuclear reaction that we call nuclear fusion. And as this fusion takes place, it emits light. And this light takes years for it to reach us. Okay, Some of the times, if you remember, when we go out tonight, if you look up and you see stars, it's likely that that star actually burnt out many, many years ago, and it's just taken light years for its light to actually reach our eye here on earth. But what a beautiful analogy that Paul has used here, because we as followers of Christ have had an internal change. And this internal change causes us to shine with the light of Christ to a crooked and wicked and twisted generation. We have been changed internally by the gospel. And it's not by living out the Bible that we are saved. We're not made right by living out the commands of God, but we do so because of this internal change. So if you want to shine like a light for God, hold fast to his word. Seek to live it out in your daily life. Let the Bible be a means for how the Holy Spirit will sanctify you as you read it, understand it, and follow it. But there's something else here that I think he needs for... And I skipped a stinking page. Whew, didn't think that sounded right. I'll get to that in just a moment. Man, I apologize for that. <laughs> 
So if grumbling shows, if not grumbling shows the glory of God, then what does it look like if we cease to grumble and complain, if we continue grumbling and complaining? The danger in us continuing to grumble and complain is that it misrepresents God and misrepresents the Christian faith. Grumbling and complaining reveals something about our heart and our attitude. It shows a lack of contentment within us. And we, as God's children, as God's people, have every reason to be content and have every reason to be satisfied because anything we have is a result of God's grace. So to complain or to grumble misunderstands our position and misunderstands our station in life. To complain and to grumble shows the world that we feel entitled. It makes it look to the world that God has somehow not given us something that we need. But in Christ, we've been given everything. His death on the cross and his resurrection have made available to us the forgiveness of sins which we receive when we repent. And our attitude should be one of contentment and joy at what God has done for us in Christ. So does your attitude at where you work show contentment in Christ? Or do you join in complaining about the things that go on in the office, about policies or bashing decisions? And workplaces are difficult, I know, but has there ever been a situation in a workplace that's been made better because of complaints? I'm not talking about addressing a concern, as I said before. And if you manage people, I'll remind you that if you complain about your superiors to the people you manage, that gives them license to complain and grumble about you. Kids, to the kids in the room, how do you react when mom and dad ask you to do something? Do you complain? Do you grumble? And maybe, maybe you don't do it out loud. Maybe you can say, you know what, I'm good. I don't even speak it. But what does your body language communicate? Does your expression communicate a grumbling or complaining? So rather than grumble and complain in the world, we live as lights. And we do so in a specific way in verse 16. Look how Paul commands us to do this. Holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So we shine holding to the word of life. And we hold to the Bible because it is the very words of life without compromising them. Jesus told us how to do this. We love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we love our neighbor as ourselves. But there's another meaning that Paul may have here because what another way of actually, it's translated in the ESV as holding fast to the word of life. But in the Greek, the verb there actually means to hold out the word of life. So the picture is that you're holding the word of life out to this twisted and wicked generation. So we shine as lights by holding it out. We do this by practicing what we teach. The immediate context, as I said, is grumbling and complaining. But it's also to do the things that are in Scripture. And so rather than our words being filled with complaints and grumbling, our words are filled with the words of life, which bring forth the way to flourish through Jesus. Not found in us, but found in Christ. St extending to them the solution for sin that separates them from God. Holding fast and holding forth the word of life. But Paul then gives one more reason to shine as a light here at the end of verse 16. He says there, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So Paul says, if you, the Philippians, shine with light, shining as stars, persevering until the end of time when Christ returns, then Paul says, it will all have been worth it. He said, I can look upon you, the Philippians, and see that my work within your city, this little Roman colony, will be worth it as I see you cross the threshold into the presence of Jesus, having been faithful, holding to the word and shining like stars for the cause of God's kingdom. And Paul can say, my imprisonment, all of the suffering would have been worth it. See, Paul's playing the long game here. Paul's not getting hung up on the short-term gains or the short-term goals. 
He's not getting hung up on a lack of growth maybe over a week. He's, getting, he's, he's focusing on a growth over years of time that we won't actually ever get to see the end of until the day of Jesus. And Paul says, when I see that, I will know that my work was not in vain. My race that I ran was not in vain. And so for us, we need to be patient in ministry, patient in investing in each other, knowing that sanctification is a step-by-step slow process, calling each other to shine as lights and as stars to this dark generation. So disciples obey, disciples shine, and thirdly, disciples rejoice. Disciples rejoice. Look with me at verse 17. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Several weeks ago, when we looked at the end of chapter one, we heard Paul tell the Philippians that he was concerned for their joy in the faith and he's concerned for their growth. That's why he hoped to return to them so that he continued to, so that he could continue to help them grow in joy and to grow in faith. So his purpose for his life then for, was for this church to grow in joy and faith. Then he gives an illustration or a picture of his willingness there, and it's an illustration that they quickly would have recognized. And I think we, if you've been in the Christian faith for a long time, if you're familiar with the Bible, it's a picture or illustration that would be familiar to you or to us as well. Both the Jewish and Greco-Roman culture would have been familiar with a drink offering, which he's talking about here in verse 17. We know this from the Old Testament. So a drink offering would have been uh, wine or would have been oil that would have been poured out beside or around the altar. So the sacrifice would have been an animal that was slaughtered and uh, the altar would have been sprinkled with blood and then the animal would have been laid on it and it would have been burned. And as it was burning, then oil or wine would be poured out around this altar. The Greco-Romans would have done the same thing. In Roman, uh, Roman sacrifice, you actually poured the wine on the altar itself. Either way, they would have understood what Paul is saying, that he is willing to live his life in a way to where he is poured out for the Philippians, for their sanctification, to help them shine as lights. Now, notice what the main sacrifice was. The main sacrifice was not Paul. The sacrifice is the faith of the Philippians. Look at what he said, upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. So the faith of the Philippians is what saved them. Paul didn't contribute. He didn't save them. But Paul is saying, I'll be the drink offering. I'll be the finishing touch on the sacrifice that you've already offered. Of the faith that you have already shown in Jesus. Now, Paul was confident that he would remain alive and make it through his prison sentence when we read chapter 1. But he's always also seeing the possibility that he may not live and he may be martyred. And that's ultimately what he's saying about his life being poured out. 2 Timothy said the same thing, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. So he views, hey, I'm willing to die for you so that you can grow in joy and in faith to be poured out for the Philippian people. If through my ministry you grow in faith and grow in the gospel of Jesus, I am happy to pour out and give my life for you so that this might happen. But then he gives us a step just beyond acknowledging and saying that it would be quote-unquote worth it. Look at what he says. He says he rejoices in giving himself as a drink offering, possibly giving his life. What an example for us. That no, it's not just worth it to die for another brother or sister in Christ. It's a joy to die for them. A joy to pour out my life so that they might grow. And we need to imitate Paul as he is imitating Christ. Do we want to stop any grumbling or complaining or disputing among us that might arise? Then let's pour out our lives for each other, serving each other, loving each other. And naturally, we think of those who pouring out their lives as being full-time ministers or pastors or missionaries. Those are obvious tangible examples, but we don't have to have those things or be those things to pour out our lives for each other. And then he commands them in verse 18, likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. 
So he's saying to them, not only am I rejoicing that I get to do this, you should rejoice that I am doing this. Rejoice that you get to be a drink offering, but then also rejoice that one is being a drink offering for you. When they think of Paul imprisoned in Rome, they should think of how they have grown in their faith because of his ministry and rejoice for what Paul has endured and done for their faith. The Southern Baptist Convention this week on Tuesday morning, there were 83 missionaries commissioned to go to the parts of the earth where the gospel is not known. Each missionary shared a testimony and how we can pray for them. Many of them to different places where we, they couldn't show their face. Their voice couldn't even be heard. We saw a silhouette and you heard somebody else reading that because of places where there was security risks where they were going. Many of them left behind homes. They left behind families. There would be grandchildren who wouldn't get to see their grandparents for years at a time. Children who wouldn't get to see their parents for years at a time. And we should pray for them, but we should also do what Paul is saying and rejoice in them. Rejoice that they are answering the call to go as we hold the rope for them, as the phrase goes. We should rejoice in our mission partners in New York and in Boston who are pouring out their lives for the sake of the gospel. Rejoicing in them for the work that they're doing. Rejoicing in them for what God is doing through them. So disciples rejoice. So how should we then live? I want to draw us back into the context of the original imperative or the original command that Paul gave at the beginning of this section, which we saw several weeks ago. Remember, Paul began this discussion and instruction by telling the Philippians to be of the same mind, calling them to unity. And I think we need to remember that as we read this passage, because it's within the context of unity, within the context of being in a single mind or in a single body that helps us further apply this. Now, Paul's talking about individual sanctification here, our own spiritual growth. But when we put this in the context of being within a body and with being unity, I think it causes us to remember that each of us plays a role in each other's sanctification. Our spiritual growth takes place within a body of believers, with other brothers and sisters in Christ, with whom we have a unity of mind, or at least working toward a unity of mind. And we each have a role in helping each other grow, in helping each other become more like Jesus. And so we need to cultivate relationships where that can take place where we are able to ask each other and hold each other accountable for our growth, to pray for each other. We need to be in relationships where we are bold enough to ask and humble enough, humble enough to receive questions like, how are you growing in holiness? What sins are you struggling with? What are some things you can thank God for in your life? What areas do you need to grow and how can I pray and help you with those areas? In other words, doing the work of discipleship. Now, one of the things we've talked about that a lot in Philippians, we talk about that a lot as a church, where we encourage discipleship relationships among our people here, okay? Now, and maybe you're in a position where you're not in one you'd like to be. Um, We've we've talked about that, but there's also a resource that I want to put in your hands. This is a little booklet written by Garrett Kell. He is a pastor in Virginia called How Can I Find Someone to Disciple Me? There's a few copies down here. Uh, It's a quick read. Might even be able to finish it on the way home. But it just has ideas on how you can find someone to disciple you. Or if you'd like to know more about discipling, it, you can find that in here too. And there are other resources that we can point you toward. And if, they're, if they get gone and you'd like some, let me know. We can order more. But I want to be, get this in our hands of our people because that's what we desire. That's what we pray for. We pray for discipling relationships and we pray for those discipling relationships to bear fruit. Okay? But we also need to remember that we don't have to hold out the word of truth to a dying generation on our own. Yes, we shine as lights. We shine as stars individually, but we also shine as stars corporately. We shine as stars as a body of believers with one mind. So if you are struggling with evangelism or speaking truth at the base level, ask others to pray for you to have courage. Ask others to pray for you to have courage to speak to the family member or coworker about your faith. Or maybe you need help in knowing how to share your faith. Come talk to us. 
And we can walk you through. Friend, the encouragement is, if you've been saved, you know the gospel. And you can share the gospel. And maybe you just need help knowing the right words to say or how to move into those conversations to transition. And we will help you with that. Or maybe you just need some help going it by your, or you don't feel comfortable doing it yourself. You may want to ask a willing brother or sister to go with you in having gospel conversations. So let's say it's a coworker. Invite that coworker to lunch and invite a brother or sister with you. Now, don't ambush them. But maybe there could be somebody with you who just having their presence with you gives you the courage or the boldness to share Christ. Set up appointments or have moments in your home Parties in your home or dinners or things in your home where you invite brothers and sisters in Christ along with those that you want to share Christ with to help you, knowing that there's someone there praying for you as you share Christ with that neighbor. As I said, shining as a light isn't a solo, isn't always a solo thing. We can shine as lights together, single-minded brothers and sisters in Christ. So friends, we have a great Savior in Christ who has brought us out of darkness and into light, giving us all that we need. So let's grow in contentment and in confidence in Him together as Seven Oaks Church. Let's pray together. Father, this morning we thank you, God, that you have given us the example of Christ of humility, Lord. And Father, our desire is to be humble before you. Lord, we desire to see our salvation, your power work within us so that we become more like you. So, Lord, that we could shine as lights to this generation that is around us in this place where you have planted us, Father. God, we thank you that it is through your son, Jesus, that you have saved us. We thank you that you have not abandoned us, and nor will you. And, God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.